Good afternoon, hello. Thank you for attending today's Refinitiv webinar. Uh, before we begin, let's cover a few housekeeping items. We will be recording today's session. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you may find multiple widgets for you to use, all I resizable and movable. Um, so feel free to um, move them around to get the most of your screen space. If you have any questions, during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will answer, we'll try to answer this during the session, but if we run out of time, they will be answered later via email. Uh, please know we do capture all the questions. Uh, also, we will be using interactive polling during today's session, so please uh, do participate. Additional materials are available in the resource list. Please download those you may find useful. Uh, you can find out more about our speakers via the speakers bio widget. Uh, for the first viewing experience, we uh, recommend closing any programs or browser sessions running, running in the background. Uh, this will help conserve your bandwidth. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so for the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or set head volume is turned up. Uh, some networks call slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is uh, recommended. If your slides are not progressing anyway, pushing F5 on your keyboard or Command plus R for Mac will uh, refresh the page. Uh, we value your feedback, so please do complete the pop-up survey at the end of the webcast. An on-demand version of this webinar will be shared in the coming days and can be also accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you today. Uh, so let's kick off. I'm uh, happy and I'm honored to introduce our speakers, Herge Fjellheim, Ingvild Serhus, and Adressing Rihel. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to our uh, webinar today, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's an um, interesting time for, for climate policy and for uh, the European carbon market grid these days. We have um, the 12th of December climate summit celebrating the Paris um, Agreement uh, fifth year anniversary coming up. Um, and more importantly for Europe, uh, leaders are meeting tomorrow and Friday um, with a very crowded uh, agenda for um, uh, the EU27 Council, uh, European Council, and um, with a wide ex expectations that uh, the European leaders are going to agree a stepped up climate ambition target for 2030 uh, during that meeting. So, uh, and for the carbon market, uh, prices are trading today around all time highs, around 30. Uh, so, one could be moving into uncharted territory as the EU ETS third trading phase is drawing to an end this year and uh, the fourth phase starts on 1st of January. So really uh, certainly a lot of topics to cover. Um, so today we will uh, cover five broad team themes. I think it's um, always useful in order to look ahead to take a peek back. So first Ingvill will give a brief historic account of, uh, of the carbon market uh, from its start. Uh, and uh, with a particular view to the very special year of 2020, which will um, set the stage for Ajay uh, to, uh, to talk a bit more about the European Green Deal uh, as a context for, for the 2030 uh, climate ambition that is, uh, could be set uh, in the next few days. Um, and he will also, he will uh, give kind of that overview of the European Green Deal and uh, they also explain why tomorrow's and Friday's um, possible decision is not the beginning of the process and it's certainly not the end either. I will look a bit more into the UTS, what a uh, higher ambition might mean for the European carbon market and uh, look into the revision of the, the scheme and dig as particularly more into the market stability reserve will come into that later on um, and uh, and discuss also what uh, a higher ambition uh, environment would look like for uh, for prices so presenting our carbon price outlook with some sensitivities uh, scenarios to that 
before I, in the end, will give the word back to Ingvill, who will uh, zoom back into today and look at some short-term dynamics and provide our output for the short term. So with that, I will give the word to, to Ingvill for our first theme. Thank you, Hege. It's uh, nice to be uh, with all of you here today, even though it's uh, virtual. Um, but as Hege said, it's always interesting to uh, take a step back to see kind of, uh, uh, I think kind of the, the price chart of, of uh, the EUTS is always kind of showing the history of the ETS. It's been uh, up and running now for 15 years. Uh, 2005 to 2007, it was um, kind of the ETS phase one, which was the pilot phase. Uh, and, and market was kind of trading quite optimistic. Uh, and we also hit kind of the all time high of 31 euros in, in April 2006. Uh, and then it plummeted, but that was because you couldn't kind of, uh, or first the realization that emissions were much lower than anticipated uh, when you had the verified emissions. Um, and also that you couldn't carry over uh, uh, allowances from, from the first trading phase to, to uh, the second trading phase. But then since 2008, it has been kind of a continuation uh, of, of uh, the ETS, where you haven't, you have all, always kind of carried over the uh, the, uh, the allowances to to kind of the, the next years without losing uh, validity. So of course, kind of then in two thousand and eight, you you uh, anticipated that it was going to be kind of quite quite a at least not maybe short market, but at least a balanced market. And that uh, and then you had a financial crisis and the realization that the oversupply was going to be uh, large. And then every year was building up. And since you didn't have uh, or the supply side was static, uh, whilst the demand side was elastic, uh, you realize that this oversupply or the problem with the oversupply was just kind of uh, going to be sustained for for a very long time. Of course, the UTS is a policy uh, instrument. It's kind of the uh, goal to, to uh, one of the main tools that politicians have, have put in place to, to reach a climate ambition. And then of, when prices were plummeting kind of below uh, 10 euros, uh, 5 euros, and then they were kind of uh, losing its relevance. It was not necessarily kind of giving an incentive to, uh, to have a greener economy in, in Europe. Um, and then you had a set of, of policy interventions. First, you had the backloading where you were holding back allowances from the market for a few years with the intention to bring them back to the market. Um, and then you also have this uh, uh, more stabilizing tool, this MSR, or Market Stability Reserve, uh, that we're going to talk quite a lot about today. But that's kind of uh, a tool that's kind of a calculate, you calculate the oversupply in the market, and then when this oversupply is above a certain threshold, then you hold back allowances from uh, from auctions. So really kind of soaking up oversupply uh, from the market. So you had some kind of optimism uh, back in from 2014 and, and, and 15 and onwards. Um, I mean, you, because you had kind of politicians uh, really kind of uh, being keen on making the ETS uh, relevant again. Uh, we we'll just say kind of the market stability reserve was uh, adopted back in 2015, but uh, starting, uh, it was decided that it will start kind of in January 2019. So you had this kind of small optimism, you had uh, the uh, Paris Agreement, and then you had kind of this crash uh, without really kind of, you had tried to kind of fix the systems. Uh, and then in, in January 2016, you saw prices crashing and it didn't help with Brexit either. It's kind of uh, the UK voting for Brexit. Uh, so uh, when everyone uh, or all markets went down, uh, carbon went down too, but it kind of remained at very low levels, at very low kind of uh, single digit numbers. Uh, and in this period when prices were around kind of hovering around five euros, you had also uh, politicians making this um, or kind of deciding on how the framework should look like after 2020. So when uh, phase four is starting in 2021, uh, so kind of that was at the time when they were deciding uh, how, how it should look like. And then, of course, you had some strengthening elements uh, into this discussion because, I mean, 
you wouldn't have a EUTS that was kind of completely unrelevant and not seen as a tool that was actually working. Uh, so then the market stability reserve, the, um, uh, which was kind of decided back in 20, 2015, you, you said that, okay, uh, we will kind of double the intake rate. We'll soak up the oversupply even, even faster. Uh, and that kind of resulted then in the price price increase and the tripling of prices that we saw in 2018, kind of the anticipation that the yearly uh, market balance was going to be yearly short uh, in uh, because of this uh, large intake to this market stability reserve. So kind of this price increase in 2018 was kind of more kind of the preparing for the market stability reserve start. And then in 20, 2019, we saw prices uh, averaging around uh, 2025. It was more taking cues from, from the fundamentals, which um, kind of uh, the uh, short-term abatement options uh, that you had kind of, it was a lot of fuel switching taking place. Uh, going going for more uh, or less emission intensive uh, power, power production in, in Europe. And then of course, in 2019, um, didn't really play out as uh, we had uh, foreseen in any any possible way, uh, not for carbon or not for our, uh, for everything else. Um, I mean, we started the year with uh, quite a bearish uh, bearish picture. We had uh, a mild winter. Uh, we had a lot of gas in storages. We had a lot of renewables. So kind of everything was. Quite, or the fundamental picture was quite bearish in the in the uh, beginning of, of the winter uh, of 2020, and then of course we had uh, the COVID lockdown uh, throughout Europe, and 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 prices were plummeting towards 15 euros, uh, but it kind of didn't stay uh, below 20 for a very long time, uh, and we saw that even though it kind of was quite clear at an early stage that uh, the <laughs> um, that the emissions would drop quite considerably due to the corona pandemic in Europe. Uh, it recovered and it recovered. Uh, we saw kind of a quite tight correlation with uh, with equities. So stimulation measures that kind of pushed up and up, up our equities uh, and then uh, carbon was following. And maybe also kind of that the market stability reserve once again came to the rescue for, uh, for, um, uh, for the carbon price. So even though we had kind of a, a, a lower demand in 2020, we know that this uh, surplus will be soaked up by the market stability reserve, even if it's working with the time lag. So we kind of came up back about 2025, 20, and then it was kind of this uh, uh, small artifact that the Financial Times was publishing this quite bullish uh, bullish uh, article on on, uh, on on carbon and kind of what uh, what a good uh, good market carbon was, uh, and then we pushed prices above uh, 30, uh, fell down quite quite uh, quite rapidly again, but at least. Um, there were a lot of participants pointing to this Financial uh, Times article for, for pushing it uh, up to, to, to 30. Uh, and then it was kind of a bit, um, I mean, we didn't have any too much kind of um, heat waves throughout Europe that uh, pushed, pushed prices higher. Um, and then in, in August, it was talk kind of about this 55% uh, uh, 2030 uh, goal. It was kind of... Um, uh, articles uh, or reports coming out saying that the commission um, would go for the, um, I mean, it was scheduled that they would kind of come, come forward with a proposal on the a 50 to 55% 2030 goal. But the rumors kind of came and said that the uh, uh, commission would propose uh, um, a 55% uh, goal, which was kind of on the high end of the scale. Uh, and also kind of, so that was kind of a supportive factor uh, um, then. And then we once again came up to to 2030, kind of, and also the parliament went for a 60% uh, or supported a 60% 2030 target. Uh, 
And then when all these was kind of announced and and, and uh, put forward by by Ursula von der Leyen, uh, prices kind of uh, uh, east east a bit after that. Uh, we also had a kind of a second wave of, of COVID with more um, more lockdown measures or more restrictions on on US. You had some nervousness on uh, on equity markets ahead of the US election, and then also kind of some some negative kind of sentiment during Brexit, which kind of uh, weighed on prices then um, uh, uh, in in October. Um, And then we have seen uh, towards kind of the, until now, we have seen uh, some vaccine optimism uh, and also a cold weather uh, situation in Europe with kind of lower than normal temperatures combined with a little wind have kind of pushed up um energy and 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 fuel prices uh, and also carbon um and also this supply squeeze uh, I'll, I'll kind of come back to that a bit later uh, but with kind of the delay of the auction start in in 2021 so that is a uh, kind of um what has been been going on, uh, both kind of on the long term and quick run through of the long long term, and also kind of what has been happening and and the drivers uh, this year, um, but. Of course, as you mentioned, it's it's it, uh, it's a big week, uh, maybe kind of a, a big day tomorrow, uh, where we we uh, hopefully will get a deal on a twenty thirty target, and I'll kind of uh, head back to to Adja so he can kind of guide you through uh, guide you through more on the details on the green deal. All right, thank you, Ingrid. So uh, we've now had a look at historical carbon prices and what's happened with the carbon prices recently. Uh, what we'll do now on the, uh, on the next slides is to, uh, to look at uh, what lies ahead for the European carbon uh, market uh, in the future. And we'll uh, start by looking at the Green Deal and the 2030 target. So in, um, in her campaign to become the president of the EU uh, Commission, Ursula von der Leyen presented us the, uh, the Green Deal. Uh, which would bring EU into a greener future, uh, aligned with the the commitments under the uh, Paris Agreement. And the 2050 uh, carbon neutrality target uh, is also a part of that Green Deal. Uh, And it has been uh, endorsed by the EU and will be legally binding together with the the climate law that's currently being negotiated between, um, between the EU Council and the Parliament. Uh, but it's not only the EU that has high climate ambitions. Uh, if we look over the past year, uh, several countries have pledged um, to become carbon, carbon neutral within 2050, 2060. And we're not talking about small countries either. We're talking about major economies such as China, Japan, South Korea, Canada. And um, although the US has been kind of off the climate grid for some years, we um, they also... Uh, has said that uh, they will uh, rejoin the Paris Agreement as soon as possible, and they're aiming for a uh, carbon neutrality target by 2050. So, so why one can say that the EU's uh, climate neutrality target is not necessarily a unique, but a part of a more global movement, it is still a very important commitment that paves the way for a strong European carbon market uh, in the next decades. Uh, if we dig a bit deeper into the EU climate policy and the 2030 target, um, Ursula von der Leyen has described the Green Deal as the EU's man on the moon uh, moment, uh, which brings the Union towards climate neutrality by 2050, but it also bring, creates jobs and economic, economic growth. Uh, but to get to 2050 uh, goal, you have to go through 2030, and that's what the Commission addressed in um, in September this year, when they uh, proposed to raise the 2030 target from the current 40% reduction uh, to 55% reduction compared to 1990 levels, and that's what is being debated uh, or have been de- uh, has been uh, debated since September, and are expected to agree upon during the next days. Uh, it must be said, though, that the uh, the division among the member states is quite significant. So on one side, you have the the member states that want an even higher target than 55%, uh, 
And then on the other hand, you have member states that don't want the current target to be touched at all. So the negotiations are tough and major concessions are expected to, to be made, particularly on the funding and funding mechanisms. Uh, one already knows that the Council has proposed to have a 2030 target at EU level rather than member state level, which goes against both the Commission's proposal and the proposal or the position that the Parliament has taken. Um, and the Parliament has also um, see a target of 60% rather than uh, 55%. Um, another element that came a bit from the sideline was um, the Hungary and uh, Poli or the Hungarian and Polish veto against the long-term um, financial budget, uh, which seems to is still not been confirmed by the EU but that there might be some kind of a uh, agreement around it but there is an uncertainty that this could crowd the agenda uh, on the climate uh, on the council summit tomorrow on Friday so um, but we'll see we'll see uh, if uh, they're able to nail the target the 2030 target uh, within this week but now that we're talking about timing, I think it's important to all just briefly mention the timing of this 2030 target, which uh, doesn't come as a coincidence. Uh, the deadline to submit the 2030 NDCs uh, under the Paris Agreement is on 31st of December, so in just a couple of weeks. Uh, and then you also have the UN-UK-led Climate Summit on Saturday. Uh, where uh, we think that many countries or several countries will use as an opportunity to present their 2030 targets. And if the, if the EU wants to be kind of in the forefront to, in the fight against climate change, it's very important that they bring something substantial uh, to this summit on Saturday um, uh, just to sh kind of show their, their ambitions and what they're able to, to achieve. Uh, as a comparison, last week the UK uh, set the bar by pledging a 68% uh, emission reduction within 2030, which is quite significantly higher than the 55% that the EU is, uh, is aiming for. So we believe that the EU will reach a 55% target. Uh, or a 55% uh, target by, uh, by 2030. Whether it's going to happen uh, within this week or a bit later, that remains to be seen. Um, but then the job isn't done at that point because uh, the target is only the first step on the way. So once you've set the target, you've basically chosen the, the ambition level. And once that's done, that's when you start defining a framework on how to achieve that target. And this is when you put together all the bits and pieces in the puzzle, uh, which are uh, all the bits and pieces, all the mechanisms that, the mechanisms that you have in the kind of EU climate toolbox. Um, that would include both existing and new instruments and mechanisms. So the burden sharing between EU ETS, non-ETS uh, non sectors, linear reduction factor, market stability reserve mechanism, uh, funding programs, et cetera, et cetera. This is something we're going to address later in this presentation. And once you have both defined and agreed on this, um, this framework, then you can put this target into legislation and into application. So it's a quite large and quite complex process. Um, and if the process isn't only complex, it's also quite time consuming because it's easy to believe that once the target is set and the commission proposes um, a, um, a framework for this by June next year that the job is done. But that's not the case because that's not the beginning. Uh, that's not the end of the process. It's actually the beginning of the process. So once the Commission has presented this draft proposal in June, all the bits and pieces and all the details will be heavily scrutinized by member states, by the different groups in the Parliament. Um, they will make their amendments and then they will negotiate on council level and in the in the parliament so that the parliament get the, gets to one position the council gets to one position and once they have their each positions those two parliament and council will um, go into negotiations before you have kind of a final final framework to get to the 2030 target 
the process leading to the to the current uh, 2030 target of 40 percent took about two and a half to three years. Uh, but given that this time around, um, you also have some other elements that kind of uh, makes the uh, makes the whole process a bit more complex with possible inclusion of new sectors, uh, and then you have the carbon border adjustment mechanisms, which might come in on the sideline and poke into free allocations. Um, so we assume that the new 2030 target and its mechanisms or instruments will take a bit longer time and be implemented first in 2024, 2025, so meaning three, four years. Um, so although a, de a decision will be made uh, within a few days, the, uh, the implementation is still several years ahead. So with that, I'll hand over uh, the, uh, the presentation to Hege, who will uh, give us a deep dive into the puzzle. Thank you, Ajay. Yeah, well, it's um, just the start. Um, so the EU ETS review and the setup of the revised emissions trading uh, system framework. Uh, it encompasses a lot of different questions. You know, what, what will the cap be? How, how steep will uh, the cap have to be reduced in order to make it 50, 455? Uh, what will the scope of the system be? Uh, will there be new sectors included? How? How do you want to, to allocate allowances under this system? And, and in particular, as Sajja mentioned, free allocation uh, and, um, and um, how it works in combination with a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, also, all, everything that has to do with funding, funds distribution of allowances. It's a, it's a big puzzle uh, and uh, it's... Uh, Sorry, it's uh, connected to, of course, the wider 2030 climate ambition uh, and all the other um, revisions that will have to be done under to, to, to reach a 55% target. So it, it's not only the UTS that will have to be revised, it's uh, the renewables target and the legislation, energy efficiency, uh, the uh, effort sharing um, uh, mechanism. Uh, amending also national climate targets potentially. So uh, a whole lot of, um, of other uh, legislation, basically all climate and energy related legislation would have to be touched upon and, and amended in order to, to, to reach a 55% uh, target. And of, of course, all of this embedded in the wider 2050 carbon neutrality anchor that will be set in legislation and the 2030 climate goal will be part of that uh, big European climate law. So the first time uh, Europe will actually legislate the climate ambition. Because previously up to now, it's only the measures that have been legal. Now also the, the targets will be legal. And then uh, as part of the UTS review, there's also a review of the market stability reserve. That was envisaged already in the legislation to be done within three years of operation. So it started in 2019. So uh, within 2021, it would have to be uh, there was a scheduled review already of the MSR, and now, naturally, with the whole uh, whole UTS up for revision, the MSR uh, discussion will be embedded in the wider EUTS uh, review, and we'll see later how why we think that is very natural and important because it's all all really linked to each other. So just um, we'll focus now on the on the. Um, uh, strengthening of the system to get to 55 uh, rather than all the other elements. So uh, what implications would going to 55 have for the cap? So this pretty small figure on the side shows uh, a 2.2% cap reduction factor, which is, which is the current uh, um, framework. That's the dotted line. And um, the commission has mentioned that they might go for another, or they are, they're looking into another way of... Um, of uh, getting to a more ambitious target, not only by a linear cap reduction factor, but also through a, what they label a one-off reduction of the cattle to put it more in line with actual emissions. It's also something that has been discussed before in the, in the, um, the review upfront uh, phase four, and the so-called rebasing of the cap. So that's uh, the, the yellow line, which takes the cap down and then 
and then uh, a linear reduction factor which is steeper than the current one. So, um, uh, of course, you would need to have uh, uh, we we have uh, we have assumed or estimated the linear cap reduction factor of six percent uh, with uh, to to get to a fifty five percent target. Of course, this is a lot of assumptions underpinning that uh, uh, as regards how much burden uh, should be put on the UTS versus other sectors. And also, uh, as Arjun mentioned, we as we assume maybe a bit conservatively, but that the, the, the process will take some time so that the cap reduction factor will not be applied until 2025. So there's only a few years to do it, to do the job. So that's uh, the reason why it's so steep. Uh, also, uh, just uh, notice that uh, reviewing the MSR uh, into all of this is 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 important because it will um, uh, it will operate differently. Obviously, if you if you reduce the cap by rebasing or by uh, LRF only, so that's that's um, a consideration to to keep in mind for the review. So just assume, this is for illustration only, that you uh, prolong those different linear reduction factors, cap reduction factors, until 2050. You get this fan of, um, of uh, lines um, with, uh, the two, with the two um, uh, linear reduction factors I mentioned, just uh, the 6% and the, and the one which is uh, associated with rebasing, you will get to carbon neutrality before 2040. So it uh, um, so so getting to zero for for the UTS uh, will actually <laughs> it's, it's the, the the dark blue line where you go back to a 2.2 percent uh, linear reduction factor after 2030. So this is for illustration. It just shows that um, that uh, in a way the importance of clarifying the EUTS framework also beyond 2030. We're now discussing up to 2030, but but it's kind of a black box for the EUTS after 2030, even though the the anchor of neutrality is fixed for the overall economy for 2050. But that's for policymakers to consider in the European climate law discussion. Now, what does uh, this higher ambition mean for uh, European emissions? So this is our uh, base case, the emissions from, from um, the two big sectors in the UTS, power and heat and in industry, in, uh, in under a 55% um, uh, ambition scenario. So what we see is basically that, that well, coal is phased out at full speed in Europe, uh, um, and uh, and a uh, 55% reduction target will require uh, um, an increase in the renewables uptake in, uh, across the whole economy. Uh, and we assume a renewable target of 38%, which is in line with what the Commission has signaled in its impact assessment for the 2030 climate ambition. So with this higher renewable target and the higher climate target uh, going hand in hand, um, we assume that the share of renewable in power generation will nearly double from from uh, 2019 levels uh, in 2030, and emissions from from this sector will be reduced by 60 percent. So what it also shows is that it by 2030 there will be very little abatement potential in the power sector, which is where we have the the feasible and cheap abatement options today, and which will kind of turn the focus um, more into more expensive abatement options in, in the industry. So it's mostly beyond the time horizon of this, this chart, but uh, uh, you will see when we get to the price chart that it's, it is quite significant. Now let's um, get to a poll question for you. So before discussing really the, the our price outlook 2030 uh, and we will we will go more into the MSR because as Ingrid talked about earlier, it has been a very important driver for for prices uh, from uh, from 2018 and also support this year, um, and we will argue that it's it's set to be very important also in the 
this decade. One of the things that have been discussed uh, is to, to strengthen the mechanism, um, and um, it will certainly be part of the, the review that uh, is upcoming now. So the question is whether the intake rate uh, to the market stability reserve, uh, which will uh, is currently at 24%, um, and will return to 12% from 2024 onwards. Do you think that that level of the intake rate will be changed during the MSR review? So you have 15 seconds to answer this question from now. Okay, so 60% of you think that it will be changed to 24%, um, which is uh, quite overwhelming. Uh, some of you think it will be even higher, and uh, about 30% think it's going to be uh, today's framework, which is actually in line with what we currently have as our base case. We are, have a base case where we assume that the MSR stays unchanged, but this will clearly be a very important uh, topic for the review. Um, so let's look at how we see the significance of the MSR under high ambition ETS. So as I said, currently the uh, surplus intake rate is 24% and then uh, reverting to 12 from 2024 onwards. Um, so the blue bars here, they uh, show our base case, a 55% target with uh, the current set of the MSR, which will, uh, um, will uh, in our base case, the MSR will work at full speed uh, all over all years until 2030. The same is the case for the yellow bars, which is uh, what 60% of you think it will be a 24% intake rate all the way in until 2030. And um, so basically, in both these cases, you have a big chunk of the, the surplus taken into the MSR um, from 2.4 to 3 gigatons is soaked up by the reserve. That is, that is uh, one and a half to two years of um, EU test emissions. So it's a big, big uh, number of allowances going into the MSR this decade. So you could have assumed maybe that uh, the MSR would be not be working so uh, aggressively, aggressively over the next few years. You have maybe you would have imagined it would have done its job, uh, taking in all the backloaded allowances, the unallocated allowances from phase three, all the historic surplus, and then after having worked aggressively with a 24% intake rate for five years, it would have kind of soaked up the surplus. But from what I showed before, the emissions um, emissions under the UETS and the fast decarbonization of the power sector, we think that the surplus will um, will that will add on to the surplus uh, over uh, the decade, and and the market surplus will actually be um, above that trigger lever for the MSR, so that the MSR will remain active and 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 very important balancing tool also this decade. Uh, and also, I think just uh, just a note on on the political appetite to strengthen the MSR uh, in under these market conditions. As uh, as uh, Ingvil mentioned, um, that when when the MSR was uh, strengthened during the ETS review for Phase Four in 2017 18, you had single digit prices, uh, and now with prices around 30, and and also. Uh, the, the cap being strengthened, uh, there is a question whether whether there will actually be, be enough willingness to also strengthen that tool during the review, but we will see. Another thing I wanted to mention uh, regarding the market stability reserve, I mean, it was set up for to serve two purposes, uh, to deal with its historic oversupply and to also prevent uh, future imbalances. But in a way, the reserve also has now serves a third purpose because during the 
the uh, review of, of, of the UTS, uh, there was a new provision coming in, an in invalidation provision, so which says that from 2023 onwards, the reserve should not hold more than the previous year's auction volume. And so a big chunk, we estimate 2.7 gigatons of allowances will be invalidated in, in 2023. And then incrementally more, more allowances will be invalidated year on year. Under um, the current MSR setup, we estimate that 3.9 3 gigatons of allowances will be invalidated over phase four, which is uh, grows to 4.6 gigatons if you assume that the, the MSR is changed to have a 24% intake rate all the way. So by invalidating allowances, you kind of change what is available to the market in a long-term time horizon because you, you lower the cap, so to speak, with the 3.9 gigatons in a way. So from, from being a cap neutral in instrument, so what comes into the reserve must come back at some point. Now it's not coming back anymore. So I think this, this is a bit um, under communicated, well, I'll say, uh, and, um, and should be considered and uh, made more clear in the, the upcoming review. What, what the role of the MSR should actually be. Uh, also to note that you see from the bars here that the, the invalidation volumes will vary with different ETSs and MSR setups. So, so that's also an important thing to consider when you, when you review the MSR, when you choose how to strengthen the cap, that it's also, um, also relevant for, for the ambition level of, of the system. Now, two slides on, on our carbon price output for 2030 with a higher climate ambition, which is our base case. So this is uh, showing, the yellow line is showing a 40% target, the blue line a 55% target. So it really shows that the ambition matters. Uh, there are some differences between these two price forecasts, other than the ambition, for instance, the UK is taken out of, of the equation in the blue line. So that accounts for some 8% on average of the price rise uh, that we see. But I think overall, um, this is the result of a tighter cap. <clears throat> and, and yeah, we assume the changes to be implemented from 2025 onwards, which is why the two lines are pretty much aligned up to up till then and then you have a, 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 a diversion from from the two lines from 2025 onwards also sorry <laughs> also the discussion i um i had earlier about the depletion of the the potential for for further emission reductions in the power sector it explains why prices go to so high levels towards the end of the phase, because it's kind of a call on more expensive abatement options in the industry that will have to to, to be uh, the price setting uh, level uh, towards the end of the phase. And finally, the role of the MSR also for price setting. This is, uh, you will recognize the blue line, which is our base case, and the yellow one, which is a 40% target. For um, illustration purposes, we assume that the MSR is not working anymore, or it's, there is no MSR from 2024 onwards, so we set the intake rate at zero, and that's the green line. So it, it, it shows that, um, that even... Um, yeah, it shows that uh, that um, uh, that that uh, the target is very important, even even if the MSR is not working. But then, with the orange line, we put the MSR intake rate at twenty four percent, so quite a big uh, big price rise, around thirty percent on average over phase four. If the MSR intake rate is is uh, beefed up to the double uh, from twenty twenty four onwards. So it shows the significance of the MSR for price setting in phase four. But of course, all of these are yearly averages and there is a lot of uh, volatility uh, and other um, 
other elements of play for the short term. Uh, I would like to zoom back, uh, <laughs> zoom back to England and zoom back uh, into the near, near term again uh, and um, look at uh, the expectations and the dynamics for the short term. Yeah, and then uh, first we can start out with my question. What's your average EUA price expectations for Q1 next year? So I'll give you some seconds before we will uh, get the results of the poll. Okay, five more seconds. So, so the results are we most of the participants expect prices to linger around uh, 29 to 32 euros. A few that thinks uh, prices will go above uh, 35 euros. Um, so that's kind of uh, quite interesting. Nice bell curve here for our results. So, of course, we have talked a lot about climate policy and how that will kind of uh, impact the future of the carbon market. But, of course, there are specific things uh, and other factors that will influence the market in the short term. Um, first of all, uh, now you all can point, point fingers and laugh at me because I've put in that phase three ends in December 2021, and that's obviously wrong. Uh, phase three ends in December 2020, so only a few days left until the third trading phase in, in, uh, of the UTS is over. Um, we have the normal uh, auction uh, pause in in December, so that means the last EU auctions with phase three allowances will be held on the 14th of December. So next Monday um, will be the last EUA auction uh, in December. And the Commission came out lately, uh, or not not too long ago, uh, saying that the first phase uh, or phase, first phase four auction, so the first auction in 2021 will be delayed due to technical reasons without giving too much information on what the technical reasons are, uh, but that the auctions will be delayed and expected to start um, start late January or early February. Um, we expect the, um, uh, the auction calendar to be published now in December. So that will also hopefully then set the start on, on what date, uh, date the auctions will start. But of course, kind of, uh, it's always when you have these uh, supply pauses, uh, it's, it's a supportive factor. Um, another thing is that free allocation uh, is expected to come out later than normal. Uh, normally each year, the uh, free allocations are start starting to be handed out to industry in uh, uh, end of February and, and, and over March and, and then beginning of April. Um, but this time around, the benchmarks are not kind of set yet. Uh, we had the um, uh, preliminary benchmarks kind of, or draft benchmarks uh, out for uh, public uh, uh, comment um, uh, published this week, um, but of course, kind of what the actual amount that uh, if free industry will get for for free uh, free allocation for the period 2021 to 2025 uh, is not set yet, and will is expected to come come in then uh, Q1 or Q3 in 2021. But however. Another artifact is that uh, I said we are ending phase three now in the uh, end of December and phase four is starting 1st of January. Um, small artifact now is that you cannot borrow uh, allowances from phase four for your 2020 compliance. So you have a demission year now for 2020. You will report your 2020 emissions in, uh, in end of March, and then you will kind of comply with uh, or hand in allowances uh, for your emissions then in April. Uh, so from, from the start of the auction, uh, um, you cannot use any of the phase four allowances, uh, cannot be used for compliance. Uh, it's not necessarily, I mean, it's been known for a while that uh, industry, for instance, cannot borrow allowances from, uh, from their 
kind of current year uh, of free allocation, um, and also kind of that you cannot use uh, auction allowances uh, or uh, auction, uh, allowances that are auctioned next year cannot be used for compliance. Uh, that's kind of been known for a while, but I think kind of this psychological factor that you 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 believe that there are someone that will be caught off guard uh, will be a supportive factor uh, also until kind of their, uh, compliance for, for 2020 emissions. So kind of the combination about this uh, delayed start of auctions in 2021 and also that phase three allowances cannot be used for 2020 compliance is a price supportive factor uh, for the rest of 2020 and also for, uh, for the beginning of, of 2021. Uh, but of course, it's uh, cold outside. Uh, we're waiting for a white Christmas. Um, it's winter season, and we're starting to kind of get to the to the period where the fundamentals actually matters. Uh, in in um, in the two preceding years, we had mild winters. We had a lot of wind, uh, and that, of course, kind of uh, when you have a lot of wind. Uh, uh, and less demand for heating, then you reduce power sector emissions, uh, which has kind of uh, put the downward pressure on, on the carbon price, uh, price. And that could also kind of uh, take place if, if the, uh, the winter repeats itself. And uh, this uh, refinitive seasonal forecast suggests that we have a uh, dry and normal uh, December. I mean, we had the cold spells and uh, little wind in the beginning of December, which has been a supportive factor uh, for both power and, and fuel prices uh, uh, until now. Um, but the outlook for January, February is kind of mild and windy weather. So we might kind of get a, a repetition of uh, the previous um, uh, previous. Um, uh, winters, and if we get that, that might be kind of a, a bearish, put some bearish pressure on, on carbon. But of course, it's uh, worth to note that uh, if we get cold spells and if we have periods with uh, low wind, uh, wind power production, that will be supportive also for, uh, for carbon, carbon price. Um, for the fuel switching price, I'm not spending too much time on that, but um, kind of the uh, fuel switching, that's when you switch from coal to, uh, to gas. Uh, historically, that has not kind of really taken too much place in ETS when carbon prices have been low, uh, gas prices have been high. Um, so the CO, this chart is showing the CO2 switching cost uh, at different efficiencies. Uh, so the turquoise, red and yellow lines are showing the uh, CO2 switching price for, uh, for, for different efficiencies. And the blue line is then showing the EUA price. So whenever kind of the CO2 switching price is falling below the uh, EUA price, then you have the incentive to switch from from more emission intensive coal to, to less emission intensive gas. Um, that was kind of not really kind of has been the reality uh, up until kind of late, late December uh, 2018. But last year we saw kind of quite tight kind of correlation between the fuel switching price and the carbon price. Um, then that has not necessarily been kind of the uh, holding true for 2020. Uh, we had carbon prices rising and gas prices kind of very low. Uh, and I mean, regardless if the carbon price was going up or down, you didn't kind of trigger any more uh, fuel switching potential or reduced uh, fuel switching as switching in, in the power sector until recently. I mean, now we have seen, uh, of course, the gas price is important for fuel switching dynamics in the winter season. So when we have had now a cold, uh, cold or a period of cold weather uh, in Europe and you have had it kind of uh, combined with a low wind, wind generation, uh, you see that you get get more kind of uh, running hours for, for, for coal power plants. Um, so far, we have estimated that fuel switching has reduced EUTS emissions by 50 million tons uh, this year. Um, but we also kind of seen, uh, seen that um, uh, at least not the least efficient coal plants, but kind of the more, more efficient gas or coal plants could get some more running hours uh, now. Um, uh, due to higher higher power demand uh, and some rebound in gas prices. 
Um, quickly summing up, short-term drivers, uh, of course, the 2030 climate target uh, might give some direction to prices. Um, seems like, um, uh, but at, as Hege and Arjen pointed out, I mean, even if, if we will have a target tomorrow, it's uh, quite a lot of uh, pieces in the puzzle that needs to be put together in order be in order before you know kind of how the framework will look like in in a new uh, new ambition uh, uh, world. Uh, supply squeeze delayed 2021 uh, one EU auction uh, and the no borrowing uh, of, of uh, EU ways. Um, and it's winter. Um, and then, of course, I mean, the you started with the uh, first UK uh, vaccination yesterday. Uh, and when you roll out these large scale vaccination programs across Europe, um, that's kind of uh, and loosening loosen up of the lockdown measures uh, throughout Europe. And that will kind of have an impact on the uh, overall uh, equity markets, which will then kind of, uh, I mean, we have seen that this year that it has been um, a supportive factor for for carbon prices, and 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 that's kind of uh, carbon might might also take cues from that going forward. Um, and then Brexit. I mean, uh, I saw this Reuters news today that it was said that Boris Johnson's were going to to Brussels for his last supper uh, uh, tonight. So we'll see if they are able to solve the Brexit uh, uh, not. To today, if if there will be a deal or if it will be a hard hard Brexit, uh, of course, uh, when it comes kind of to the EU TS related questions, I mean, uh, the UK installation has known for a while that they will um, they will be or they will comply with 2020 emissions. So uh, even though there won't be a deal, they know that uh, they will be uh, reporting emissions for 2020. They will comply with emissions for 2020. And it's all also been known for a while that UK is going to be out of the EU ETS. So in that sense, kind of the Brexit is more kind of the overall sentiment, uh, which will then kind of spill over to carbon. Uh, we believe them the more than kind of uh, this uh, abrupt exit and a big sell off from, from UK installations. Uh, Q4 uh, average price uh, is around 26.4. We have had, had kind of prices above 30. 30 euros again today, we might kind of see a test of, of, uh, of this year high of 30.8 euros. Uh, uh, I mean, the carbon price is, is, is in a quite strong, strong, strong uptrend uh, at the moment. Uh, for Q1, we think kind of the prices will average uh, 29 euros. So in line with kind of the majority of, of uh, the respondents here. Um, and then overall for 2021, we have 28 euro, uh, year, euro on average uh, price. Um, and then 2021. 22, uh, 30 euros. And then I'll hand it over for Hege to take a quick take uh, uh, takeaway for, for this, uh, from this webinar. Thanks, Ingrid. Yeah, that's going to be quick because we're running out of time. <laughs> Just uh, to sum up, um, I think we can say yes, climate ambition matters for, for the carbon, for carbon markets. Something else would have been very strange. It's a politically created market. And when you change the supply side uh, to the level that we we will do with a 55% reduction target, of course, it should matter. It should matter both for, for the long term and a long term price forecast and also as support in the short term. Uh, and um, yeah, the UTS won among several different drivers behind the speedy decarbonization of European power sector. So I guess trying to answer at the same time some of the questions we got in about overlapping policies. So yeah, it's one of the drivers that you have uh, the whole phase out driven by other factors as well. And uh, you will have the, the renewable target that uh, if that is met, it will require a lot of other uh, measures to, to reach that target, which will uh, work in conjunction with the UTS and the carbon price. We still see a significant role for the MSR as a market balancing tool until 2030. But we also see a, a need to discuss the role of the MSR going forward and uh, to, to understand what kind of role it should have uh, in the market until 2030. 
and then finally to just to pick up <laughs> on uh, on what will maybe be the the result of, of the of the next few days it will not be a done deal even if it's it's a deal on the 2030 target it's significant but there is a long process uh, and uh, a lot of stuff to follow uh, on the european carbon market and on the policy side in the next few years so with that i think we'll uh, have uh, some time to go to go through some of the questions that you've had uh, not too much uh, but we'll make sure just to answer them uh, by email if we don't uh, have time to go through all of them just uh, some quick clarifications on our price forecast uh, those are nominal prices that we use and uh, for the um, uh, for our assumptions we assume there's a question about whether we assume rebasing in our base case and uh, no, we assume uh, we have assumed that, that the cap is strengthened by the LRF only in our base case so that's a linear reduction factor of 6.1 percent and then I think there are some questions on um, uh, let's see on uh, industry abatement maybe you want to take that Archer? yeah sure right uh, so there is one question if we are to reach uh, net zero by 2050 uh, what would the key uh, and there has hardly been any abatement in the, in the industry so far uh, all key areas of abatement um, and you know, which sectors so well, just briefly we don't have that much time but yeah it's true uh, the abatement in the industry has been quite limited until now and basically two reasons that lots of the emissions have been covered by free allocations and the carbon prices have been quite low historically uh, but now going forward carbon prices are being uh, at least as our forecast says and the free allocations are also being reduced so in our base case we don't have any kind of disruptive technologies uh, whether it's uh, hydrogen or ccs within the 2030 time frame that's something we see coming after 2030 so we would expect to see more incremental abatement whether that goes for waste heat recovery uh, better installation of um, of the installations etc so um, so the larger abatement in the industry is expected after 2030 um, because the business case basically doesn't make sense yet it's too costly uh, the projects which are in the pipeline at the moment whether it's hydrogen CCS is either in the planning phase or in the testing phase, um, but nothing has come to the commercial level. And the few projects uh, that, say, on the CCS side, you have one project that has been um, granted government uh, funding. Now, that's basically, I think we're talking close to 70% subsidies on that project. And that's the type of projects we expect to see in the near, in the next few years. These, these will not be commercial, commercial viable but they'll be heavily subsidized. And those subsidies are very important. So you need to uh, do the learning. You need to go through the learning curve. You need to get the cost down. So even though we don't see any large abatement in the next six, seven, eight, nine years, you will have some commercial projects which would be financed by the national governments or by the EU. But those projects are needed to get the abatement post 2030. Can I take one clarifying fine questions on the uh, phase three auctions? Uh, we have had a question if there are uh, still some more phase three auctions taking place in 2021, and the answer is no. Uh, so the last phase three auction will take place then on uh, the 14th of December. However, on the exchanges, there will kind of, for, for all the forward contracts with delivery before April, will be delivered with phase three uh, uh, allowances. Uh, and also there will be a differentiated, differentiated uh, uh, phase or spot contracts. Uh, so then kind of one on phase three and one on phase four for allowances. Okay, thank you, Ingvi. Um, still some questions, but I think we're running out of time. We'll make sure to give back to each and every one of you. And with that, I want to 
Thank you all for um, participating in our webinar and um, let's all look forward for the next few days and see what comes out of the summit. Uh, wish you all a great afternoon and um, goodbye from Oslo.